Hi, everybody. I'm Danny Washington. It's my pleasure to be here for the Artists as Activists panel. I'm a science communicator and TV host, and I'm just thrilled to be surrounded by these three incredible humans because uh, not only are they activists, but they also are inspired by art, all different forms of art. And they're going to have a vibrant conversation talking about just that. So we have Lily Gardner. She is an organizer for the middle school and high school support team for the Sunrise Movement. And she's also the coordinator of her own local hub. We've got Kevin Battelle, who is also a youth climate strike organizer and the founder and executive director of One Up for Action. One Up Action, excuse me. And Matt McGorry is an actor and activist, and you probably recognize him from Netflix's comedy series, comedy drama series, uh, Orange is the New Black, and ABC's How to Get Away with Murder. So without any further ado, I'd like to pass it on to Matt. He will be leading the conversation. Great to see you guys. Thank you so much, Danny. We appreciate it. Hey everyone, how you doing? What's up? <laughs> um, I am here from my living room in Los Angeles. Um, I had a dream last night about getting a haircut. Um, it felt very cathartic for me. I actually touched my head while I was sleeping and it uh, turns out I didn't, but I thought for a moment that actually I had. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm really excited today um, to be here, to be having this conversation um, with two amazing folks, Kevin Battelle and Lily Gardner, um, who I'm just so excited to be meeting in the digital flesh um, and, to, and to really get to have a conversation with them because they're doing some really incredible, inspiring work um, that I'm just uh, myself personally very inspired by as well. Um, I wanted to sort of kick off with a quote by AOC. Um, she said, we don't have time to sit on our hands as the planet burns. For young people, climate change is much bigger than election or re-election. It's life or death. So um, for myself, my sort of entrance into activism um, began in feminist politics. Um, and that definition has expanded for me over time with the recognition that there are many different layers, right? Feminism is not simply about men and women. It's about um, beyond the gender binary. It's not just about um, this sort of prototypical idea of women that, does, that kind of erases what women of color also have to experience layered on top of it. So race is a big component of that. Um, and for me, sort of my introduction into climate justice was really actually an extension of my work um, in feminist politics. Uh, my understanding that, that climate change disproportionately impacts women, impacts women of color, um, poor, poor communities, and particularly poor communities of color. Um, so as a part of racial, gender, and economic justice, uh, climate justice is a huge and important part of my life. Um, that's why I'm so really thrilled to be talking to two incredible folks here today um, who are doing this work um, in the way that it needs to be done. Um, and with all politics, really, it's, it's important with all social justice politics to make sure that those who are most directly impacted um, are at the front. And we've seen this time and time again, um, when it comes to climate change, youth activists are at the front and are the ones that we need to be listening to and centering and uplifting. So I'm really excited to be doing that today. Um, so as a part of that, I'd love to sort of extend and, and, um, and kind of ask some questions off the bat. Um, Lily, I'd love to know uh, if you could tell me about yourself and what you are most passionate about. Yeah, that's such a good question. Um, I would say, hi everyone, my name is Lily. Um, I'm 16 years old and I am from Lexington, Kentucky. And I think that like you, Matt, I came to climate change work, not necessarily from an environmental background, but from a really environment or economic justice centered background. I grew up in Eastern Kentucky and Appalachia. Um, so a just transition and the, and creating an economy that works for everyone, especially out as we're coming out of um, the current pandemic is, has really been my passion um, throughout my climate organizing. Thank you. And uh, Kevin, um, can you tell me a little bit about yourself and what you're most passionate about? Definitely. I guess a little bit about myself. I really got started with climate justice around when I was 12 years old. So it's about been, I think, eight years, seven years. Uh, not too sure about that, but it's been a long time. I really got involved with food justice and, um, you know, we, uh, food prisons, food deserts, because here in Los Angeles, we are a food prison and a food desert, specifically my community of South Central Los Angeles. So definitely that was one of my driving passions to make sure that um, my community understood where food comes from um, and, you know, just food equity um, within my community. Um, and then I really got involved with climate justice when I was affected by the climate crisis and air pollution. The, you know, as you know, 
Los Angeles is ravaged by air pollution and smog pollution. Um, and so a lot of my community members were getting asthma, were getting heart respiratory issues, heart palpitations, um, all these other health issues. And so um, when I got it, I knew that it was stemming from those issues, from uh, the air pollution and smog pollution. And then I really took the mantle up and saying, like, I need to start advocating for my community and making sure that people understand what is going on in South Central Los Angeles and in, in Los Angeles. Um, I guess a passion of mine is, you know, um, making sure that people understand that this is, this is a crisis that can be fixed if we act on it. You know, the Green New Deal, this is the time for it. Um, yeah. We have to create millions of jobs and that's what is my driving passion is making sure that we pass these policies um, in order to have a, you know, green economy. Yes, beautiful, thank you. Um, and it's so important, right? Like in, in, we see all over the world and even in Los Angeles, right? The areas where, um, where climate change, climate injustice, these extractive mm -hmm. policies are, are enacted or tend to be in poor communities and communities of color, uh, most often as they're sort of uh, related to that. And, and the disproportionate effects of climate change also are affecting folks. Um, Lily, I'd love to hear a little more about uh, sort of in the vein of what Kevin was saying, just um, how you've sort of seen your community be um, been impacted by, by um, climate change as well and, and the policies that are sort of causing it. Yeah, absolutely. So I grew up in Sawyersville, Kentucky, which is this hamlet of like 2,000 people. Um, if you're from Eastern Kentucky, we call it a holler. Um, and yeah, so for the vast majority of my childhood, I was really cognizant of the impact that extractive industries, whether that be coal or fracking or logging, had on my community at large. My family was farmers, so in no way am I saying that I was disproportionately impacted by those, by those effects, but it impacted our community on the whole, and the realities of the opioid crisis and cyclical poverty, and an economy that was owned by outside industries, not by the people who live there, was super poignant. And I think I came to this work after having grown up there and understanding that yes, climate change was real, and yes, we needed to save the planet, but having this extreme cognitive dissonance about what saving land would mean when I came from a place where land was all that many people had, right? My family farm was the most important thing to my father's family and has been in our, been in our family for generations. So, so what does it mean to ask people to conserve their land when sometimes it's, it's all they have to make a living off of? And so holding all of that, I came to this movement kind of wary of what environmental activists I had seen in the past stand for. And the fact that that wasn't jiving um, with my experiences growing up in a place that really needed something like a Green New Deal or a just transition. And it was only when I saw this 2018 action after the midterms in Nancy Pelosi's office with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez that said very clearly, no, we're done with the ways of the past. We're here to demand justice as a top priority for the environmental movement. And we're here to demand all of these things that frontline communities have been asking for for decades, that I realized that the climate justice movement was where the intersection of a lot of my background um, came in with, with this like deep fear that I had for my future and for the future of, of many other people my age. Beautiful. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, I'd love to, to take a moment and, and sort of transition into a different question um, that I think about at times and, and I think is, is important to ask um, folks like yourselves. Um, but what, what do you think, what do you see as um, sort of the important actions that adults who seek to be allies of youth activists can take? Um, where do we maybe fall short or and, and where do we, where can we Stand some improvement, some room for improvement. To either to either Kevin or Lily, whichever. Lily, would you want to take the first segment of that question and then I'll jump in? Sure. Um, so I think fundamentally adult uh, allies are so, so important to this fight. Um, I think their access and resources that adults have that young people simply do not. Um, and I think as you know, as a child who is still living in my parents' household or my mother's, 
having just her support, whether that be financially or emotionally for the work that I'm doing is an integral part of my ability to do it in the first Mm. place. So I think Mm. at a personal level, that's what adults can do. And I think more broadly, I still think that society has to reckon with this intense, um, yeah, this intense feeling that young people have not yet proven themselves, that we don't know what we're talking about, that we're too young to have a voice, whatever these narratives we're hearing are, I think it's up to adults who are already in the spaces that we know we need to occupy to raise those concerns and say, actually, these are the people who are ready to, to change the narrative and to do what's necessary. Um, and we have, to, we have to start to end the, our perception of young people in this country and around the world. Yes, yes, thank you. Get me fired up. Woo, I appreciate it. <laughs> Kevin, I would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, definitely. I, I Like Lily said, I think it's definitely important that um, adults offer the resources and just be good allies on that. And I guess I, I am a, I'm coming from a different perspective because I see, you know, right here, you know, in the climate movement, a lot of black and brown and indigenous voices are really, you know, important. We make we have to make sure that we understand the privilege that we come from. You know, a lot of not just adults, but young people in general need to understand, like, you know, privilege plays a big part in how uh, people can use their voices. So definitely, I think adult allies are really key in this and making sure that marginalized voices are heard the most. And if you have the resources to uh, make sure you're uplifting those voices, because it's, you know, those voices in those communities are being affected the most by the climate crisis. Um, So I think that's one thing is just like making sure that you assess what your privilege is. And if you're able to offer offer that voice to those marginalized voices, to those marginalized communities, uh, so that they can be uplifted. Yes, thank you, Kevin. Y'all are just, man, how's your age? Let me tell you. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, and, and that actually, even me saying that reminds me of something that I feel like um, I hear sometimes something, a, a statement that is, that can go kind of both ways. Sometimes I hear like adults say, like, oh, the youth, they've got it figured out. And on one hand, I can see from some folks who are already actively involved and uplifting and supporting, I'm like, I mean, yes truthfully they you know y'all know exactly you know what what you're doing and you have the passion and the vision and then on the other hand I also hear older folks sort of folks my age or in generations older sometimes saying that and it's almost like they got it let them figure it out but that's not the same as necessarily saying no actually they have the vision but how do we support that vision which is a really important part of that process Um, and it just in the same way as any kind of allyship can't be about men leaving women to figure out you know uh, gender equality or white people living, uh, leaving people of color to figure out uh, anti-racism it has to be a, a collaborative solidarity, um, effort of solidarity. Um, I'd love to hear if there are any sort of like artists that have been inspiring you um, in, in sort of the work that you're doing um, or yeah, what your relationship with, with art is sort of in that, in that realm of activism. Sure. Um, I can start. I think that art is such an important way that we are able to communicate this collective vision that we have for the world um, and often can transcend kind of the, yeah, the systemic oppression that our country faces and is a way that we can think about a world that is free of white supremacy, that is outside of a heterosis patriarchal society, right? And so I find art as as a really hopeful way to communicate this this vision that I know we need and this world that I know we have to get to. Um, And I also think that it brings people in who otherwise perhaps would be wary of the message we were saying for one reason or another, and but are able to see themselves in this collective vision and are able to realize that rather than how climate organizers have been painted by the left or the right, this is an opportunity um, And this is a movement that's going to ensure that working class people, folks on the front lines and folks of color are included in ways um, in rebuilding our society that we know that we know are necessary. Beautiful. Thank you. I guess much of what Lily just said, you know, I think I also can relate to is like we as young people really relate on what we see visually. And I think Mm -hmm. artists present that, you know, even through music. I know Billie Eilish and Jaden Smith and all these other uh, people, especially when the Earth Day video came out um, or the Earth, uh, We Love Earth 
video came out with many artists, you know, saying that they, they want to protect what is, you know, you know, what is being destroyed. Um, and I think that visually in, you know, it, it targets audiences that never even thought about the earth that wanted to protect it. And I think it also presents a opportunity for us as a movement to work together with artists and with young people to make sure that, you know, more people are involved, not just uh, young people, but people from professions like doctors, singers, songwriters, graphic designers, all these different other professions, uh, bringing it all collectively together, working collectively, making sure that we're fighting for climate justice and environmental justice, and we achieve the goals together because in a, in a perfect society, you know, you know, these things are, you know, that would be a perfect society is making sure that everyone is coming together um, and working collect collectively. And I think um, to just end my thought um, is that, you know, I've been really inspired by a lot of these artists and their music. You know, I know that um, my, some of my friends got involved in the climate movement because of Billie Eilish and her song, just seeing that the, you know, that we are destroying the world uh, with oil production and all these other disastrous, um, you know, you know, uh, disastrous um, events and things that disastrous industries that we're doing um, for greed. So I think yeah. it, it is a powerful, powerful tool of getting people involved that were never involved. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you. Um, Danny, a quick question. Do I have time for two more questions? I know time, if the 20 minutes oh, are yeah. coming up. Okay, okay. We have time. Yeah, you mm -hmm. have cool. about, we have about 10 more minutes. Oh, great. Perfect. Love it. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Um, so I'd love to hear, Kevin, um, what you feel like are the next, um, the next steps for the climate movement based on your experience. Um, what needs to happen moving forward? Moving forward, I think collectively, we have a lot of climate organizations, um, you know, um, you know, at Float, we have a lot of people working on systematic action, but we also need to mobilize the young people. We're getting out millions and thousands of young people to these climate strikes. Um, and I think when they go back home, it's going back to the regular schedule. And I know because I've spoken to many youth, I've been to many climate strikes. And what I've I can continued hearing is that they only come out to the climate strikes when they happen. And there's nothing really for them to do or there's no resources for them to do. I think what is needs to happen in the movement is that we need to collectively work together, making sure that young people are not just coming to the climate strikes and demanding of our you know, world leaders and our government officials that we need climate action, but also going back to their own communities and making a difference with individual action. So individual action and systematic action go hand to hand. Um, and I think that is what we really need to do as a movement together. And it's already happening gradually, but also is making sure throughout the movement, we, we fix what needs to be fixed. In the movement, we're not perfect. We always make mistakes. Us youth make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. I think we need to work collectively as a whole movement to make sure that we're demanding our, our leaders uh, of what we want, the policies that we want, the Green New Deal, all these other uh, amazing, amazing policies that are going to make a difference in our world. Yeah, that's really, uh, thank you for that. It's also, that kind of reminds me of this idea. I think a lot of times folks maybe want to stay back because they don't know exactly what to do. And um, mm -hmm. in terms of building the future that we want, that we've never lived a part of, um, it is about, uh, no one person can have the idea in their head, right? It's a collective mm -hmm. process of trying things, seeing what works. And in terms of movement building and uh, building, you know, strategy for direct action and being a community with other folks, that's part of the way that we experiment for how we want our worlds to work, right? Or democratic sort of um, decision making in that process. So there's yeah. value, like you were saying, just also in the process of being out there and working to create the change and to figure out what exactly works because no one has all the answers. That's just the, yeah. the way it is. Yeah. Um, Lily, would love to hear your, hear your thoughts on that as well. What, what, what's, what's next for us or what should be next? For sure. Well, I don't think we can like talk about the future of the climate movement without recognizing the crisis that we currently face and recognizing that in the short term, we need to shift our organizing to ensuring that people are receiving tests, PPE, right? That Medicare for all, that healthcare and healthcare access is for everyone. These are ideals and values that we have in the climate justice movement and that we really need to be focusing on in the short term. And then I think in the long term, we have not only an opportunity to combat climate change and create a vision of a Green New Deal, of a society that's gonna work 
work for everyone, um, but also a society that is gonna have like really just long-term relief following the current pandemic. So things like guaranteeing a federal job, that's absolutely a part of a Green New Deal and also something that we know is gonna be so integral because we're gonna have so many people unemployed. So I think that for the foreseeable future, the climate justice movement is not truly a climate justice movement until we recognize the duality the duality of the crises that we face, both like health and economic, um, COVID and climate, and understand how the solutions that we have short-term and long-term to both are helping us achieve these broader values of justice and equity for everyone. Yes, thank you. Y'all are giving me life out here. I'm really, uh, <laughs> it's really, I appreciate it. Um, I'd love to ask a question um, that is, a bit unlike the others, um, I'd love to take a moment and sort of ask in our, in our boldest vision, um, if we could, if you could paint a picture for what you would want that to look like, right? And it doesn't necessarily have to look only like policies. It can be a little more even dreamy and tapping into that sort of artistic side. I'm just, I'm interested in what that looks like. Um, uh, would anyone want to start first on, on that one? I don't want to throw anyone into it, but, um, Kevin, can I pick you? <laughs> Lily, I'll, I'll think about it because I literally need to think about these things. Lily, would you want to go okay. first and can, answer I, that? Sorry. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and, and I just want to say too, like again, it's not, you know, sometimes it's, you know, y'all are doing such incredible work in figuring out like yeah. all the day-to-day -day and all the details. And sometimes I think like it is a diff obviously a different transition, but sometimes even for myself, like, closing my eyes and taking the moment to like dream about like, you know, what is, what, how do I want people to feel and to be, and what do I want communities to be like, um, can just be a powerful moment. So, um, but you know, whatever it is, is, is perfect. And, you know. Yeah. I think that speaking really broadly, what I dream about is like this, just like a, a society that has these like shared values where everybody is, where everybody feels safe where everybody has a sense of dignity, where everybody feels welcome, and, and one in which we're all like collectively supporting each other um, and care about each other's um, shared future and identity. And so I think to get really abstract sometimes, yeah, sometimes when I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about like really like Helen Frankenthaler painting and kind of like the emotion that these, this piece of visual art like really sparks inside mm. of me of this intense feeling of like tranquility, which I think is something mm. my generation and for marginalized communities, generations before us have never had the opportunity to feel, um, especially in the face of the climate crisis. And yeah, I, I hope that, I hope that we have a future in which we all feel comfortable enough to stop and take a breath. Beautiful. Thank you for that. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Kevin, so what feeling, buddy? <laughs> good, good. Um, so I think I want to add to this, like, you know, what to what Lily said is I, I actually, you know, think that is definitely right. And that since the COVID-19, you know, pandemic is a wake up call for us. And I guess we can transform our country by working collectively. And I said this before in uh, numerous questions. And I think what I see and what I really want people to, you know, dream big about is that there is hope. We can achieve the things that we want to, that we are fighting for. And that, you know, like Lily said, is that we want to, you know, feel safe, you know, in our own environments and making sure that we can take a breath and see the world as it is, you know, um, but also making sure that we continue fighting for what is right. And um, collectively, I want people to never stop fighting because the climate mm -hmm. crisis will never go away unless we don't, you know, unless we don't uh, enact these policies and stuff like that. And I've brought that up multiple times, but I think it's just important for me as a person is like making sure that we never stop fighting because the fight is never over, you know. Um, and that's my hope is that people never give up, you know, the passion to fight for what is right. Yes, thank you. And, and that's beautiful. I, I deeply appreciate that. And I feel like what I'm taking away is also, right, like there are these core principles that are uh, essential to the well-being of all of us, for everyone to feel safe. And part of that is for all of us to continue to be invested in that struggle, right? The, mm -hmm. the means in which we achieve these can look 
a myriad of different ways, but ultimately, you know, we want folks to be able to feel safe and to thrive. Um, and we recognize in order to do that, we have to keep, keep the pressure on. Um, I just want to say, uh, Lily and Kevin, this conversation has been super amazing and I feel very inspired by y'all. I loved doing my research on you before this and just being so thrilled to be in this conversation. Um, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for what you're doing for, um, for the planet, um, but also for people, for all folks, um, including folks perhaps of my generation, sometimes older, who, um, you know, can't necessarily get the vision. Thank you for igniting that passion. Um, and I'm excited to see the change that you continue to make. So thank you for being here uh, with me. I appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Six year, sixth grade me who watched Orange is the New Black and it went, but would be very <laughs> excited right now. Oh, uh, nice. Thank <laughs> cool. you. Cool. I appreciate it. Kevin, Lily, Matt, great job, you guys. What an eloquent thank conversation. You. Thank you for your time. And make sure you stay tuned. Earth Day Live 2020. Happy Earth Day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Take care. Stay safe, stay home, sending love, sending well wishes.